Good morning, and a very warm welcome to this act of Christian worship, live streamed from Christ Church of Longboat Key in Florida. Whatever you are joining with us in our worship today, we bid you a very warm welcome to the extended geographical fellowship of God's people. 
Just a number of quick announcements very, very quickly. Uh, at 11 o'clock this morning, after the service has concluded, we will have Sunday School and the final in our series of Hymns of Faith when we look at the great hymn, At the Name of Jesus. That's 11 o'clock on Zoom after worship this morning. Secondly, a word of thanks for all who came Thursday and made donations for our daily bread, one of the caring ministries that we seek to support from this congregation, and one which, because of the crisis that the world is engulfed by at the moment, is facing increasing demands on its resources. And we are grateful to everyone who helped to bring produce to share with our daily bread and their ministry. And also thanks, obviously, uh, as part of our ongoing support of the life of the church and the missions that we support, our thanks to those who are sending pledges in to the church office to enable us to sustain our commitments in ministry and mission. Again, on Thursday afternoon, four o'clock, on Zoom, an opportunity to mix and mingle uh, with other members and friends in the congregation. It's just a little fellowship catch-up time, hear what's going on, share any news uh, that people may have, and enable us to stay at least virtually connected with one another through the church's fellowship. And again, for our worship this morning, we have tapped into our uh, database of recorded services, and the two hymns that we will share in worship today have been taken from the service for the Sunday after Easter last year. But wherever we are at this moment, we are one in the fellowship which the risen Lord makes possible and gifts. And so we gather to offer God our worship and our praise in the firm conviction which the psalmist has declared. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it.
why we bring our prayers of confession to God. And if you have your bulletin there with you at home, I would invite you to join me now in saying the prayer together. Eternal God, we acknowledge in your presence that we are not the people you have called us to be. Our faith wavers in its conviction. Our hope wilts before difficulty, and our love wanders from its source. Forgive us, we pray. Restore us by your Spirit, and in your goodness, give us the faith that fears nothing, the hope that dares anything, and the love that grows from your deep love for us as seen in Jesus' death and resurrection. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, God hears the prayers we offer, spoken and unspoken. And in His mercy, God forgives us all for Jesus' sake. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I would turn to the Word of God, to the Gospel of John, continuing John's narration of the story of Easter. From the 20th chapter, we begin to read on in the 19th verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Again, we share in this prayer which addresses the crisis in the world right now. Again, I would invite you to say it out loud wherever you are. Lord, in a time of anxiety, be our peace. We believe you are our strength and our salvation. Let our faith and trust in you allay our fears and bring peace to our hearts. Lord, in a time of uncertainty, be our guide. Lead those who take decisions. Strengthen those who implement decisions. Protect those affected by decisions and grant that all decisions may build up the common good. 
Lord, in a time of crisis, be our guardian. Bless those whose work exposes them to danger, health professionals, first responders, and those who still work in public places. Bless those involved in research that may offer health and healing, peace and hope. Lord, in a time of need, be our defender. Bless all who seek to serve the needs of others, bringing help and sustenance. Bless all who are lonely or alone, elderly people, vulnerable people, and those who worry for their futures. Undo the work of all who share falsehoods and half-truths. Reveal the error of their ways to those who disregard warnings, live carelessly, and put the lives of others at risk. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, give us the strengthening assurance of your presence and the hope that you will bring us safely through this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
in verse 20 of the passage we read from John's Gospel today. The words, after Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. He showed them his hands and his side. Have you ever noticed what an important detail that is in the Easter story? The passage we read together this morning from John 20 shows that this detail was of great significance to one of the central characters in the story John gives us. And I'm not talking about Thomas. I'm talking about Jesus. People often blame Thomas. They sometimes dub him Doubting Thomas. They criticize him because he said unless he could touch, he would not believe. But you know, that wasn't Thomas's fault. That was Jesus doing. Think about what happened. Ten of the disciples were huddled together behind locked doors for safety's sake. John tells us they were afraid. Thomas was not with them. We don't know where he was. We don't know what he was doing. But at least he wasn't so fearful that he was afraid to go out. He was out somewhere doing something. And then, as soon as he returns, he is verbally barraged by excited disciples. We have seen the Lord, they yell. Can you imagine the conversation? The disciples tell Thomas, we have seen the Lord. You've what? We have seen the Lord. When? This evening, while you were out. Where? Here, in this room. But how? We don't know. He was just there, here. One minute there were ten of us, the next, there were eleven of us, and the extra person was Jesus. He was here. But how, Thomas asks again, we don't know. The doors were locked. No one unlocked them. He was simply here, standing among us. Then what happened? Jesus said, Shalom, peace be with you. You're sure it was him? Yes, he showed us his hands and his side. He what? He showed us his hands and his side. Now, press the pause button at this moment, and notice, before Thomas had ever had a thought about the hands and side of Jesus, indeed, when Thomas wasn't even there, Jesus, unbidden, showed his hands and side to his disciples. It was Jesus' initiative. For Jesus, and for the disciples' sake, his hands and side were important, obviously for identification. The scars of a so recent execution narrowed down the field of the people that the unexpected stranger might be. And it was quickly obvious he wasn't either of the other two whom the Romans had executed that Friday. It had to be Jesus. It was Jesus, the Jesus who had been crucified. 
and he showed them his hands and his side. But in addition to identifying himself as the one who had been crucified, Jesus also interprets for them what his resurrection means. The Lord who greets them that Easter evening is not just the risen Lord. He is the crucified and risen Lord. And you can't have one adjective without the other. Oh, perhaps at times we would like to. We'd be happy with an Easter Lord who simply reflects the joys of spring and nature's cycle of renewal or perhaps of a mythical expression of the truth that some ideals will never die, or some truths are just too good to be destroyed. No, that's not Jesus. The Easter Jesus is the crucified Jesus, and to make the point, he showed them his hands and his side. I think what this means is that Easter is not so much a happy ending as a new beginning. Easter starts a brand new chapter in God's fight against the evil in the world. The affirmation of Jesus as the crucified and risen Lord, is central to our faith and helps us address one of the strongest arguments against our Christian faith, namely the presence of evil in the world. The argument goes, everyone's heard it, how can God, if God exists, permit so much evil in the world? the blood-stained horror of the 20th century, along with all the evils we have since seen, Oklahoma City, 9-11, Sandy Hook, and all the others are used by people to argue fiercely against the existence of a loving, powerful God. The critics say that at best, God is either powerful but not loving, or loving, but not powerful. And that's a challenge to our faith. The existence of evil in the world that our loving God declared was very good is a mystery that again and again the Bible acknowledges, but never explains. Instead, the Bible shows us God restless and relentless in resisting evil, seeking to defeat it and calling His servants to join Him in the fight. From the exodus in Egypt, through the return from the exile for the Jewish people at a national level, or at a more personal level from the prophets' calls for an end to greed, cruelty, and oppression, then the ministry of Jesus healing, helping, reconciling. In all of this, we are shown a God who resists evil and works to redeem it. And when evil mounted its full frontal assault on God's Son, He submitted humbly and faithfully. But when God's power raised Jesus from the dead, God Himself is telling us that evil will not have the last word, nor the final victory. I love the way Tim Keller puts it. If we again ask the question, why does God allow evil and suffering to continue, and we look at the cross of Jesus, 
We still do not know what the answer is. However, we now know what the answer isn't. It can't be that God doesn't love us. It can't be that God is indifferent or detached from our condition. God takes our misery and suffering to him. God takes our misery and suffering so seriously that he was willing to take it to himself. That's God's response to evil the cross. And the meaning we discern as we contemplate the cross is this. Suffering love is the truth and the beauty of God and Christ. Suffering love is the truth and the beauty of God and Christ. William Temple, that great Archbishop of Canterbury from the 20th century, put it well when he said, the wounds of Christ are his credentials to the suffering human race. The horrors of World War I provoked many angry, bitter poems throbbing with the pain that that hell on earth produced. One of the most vivid of that work of poetry, Jesus of the Scars by Edward Shillito, reflects on the text we are considering today. Two stanzas from Shillito's poem. If when the doors are shut, Thou drawest near, only reveal those hands, that side of thine. We know today what wounds are, have no fear. Show us thy scars, we know the countersign. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. And if you think about it, Christ's wounds were the climax of a life of total identification with our human plight. Remember, Jesus knew hunger and homelessness. He suffered the loneliness of being misunderstood, the rejection based on racial prejudice, the wearying hostility of enemies and opponents the physical and mental abuse that preceded his death. And then on Calvary, one of the worst forms of execution a sadistic human mind could devise. Jesus knows what suffering is. Jesus seeks to strengthen and sustain us by His presence with us in the midst of it. And friends, there's a faith to carry us through the challenges the world is facing at this time. All the fear and uncertainty, the humbling realization that all human progress can be so easily jeopardized. All our selfish inequalities cruelly exposed. All the daily blessings that we take for granted. 
now at risk of being taken away. And all our leaders reduced to ineffectiveness. And we are suffering from some or at times from all of these things. We need to know that Jesus knows what suffering is and Jesus seeks to strengthen and sustain us by His presence and bring us through. In the current issue of the Christian century, Laurel Mathewson, an Episcopal priest in San Diego, introduces us to the choir director in her church. The choir director at the church where I serve, she writes, has unusual credentials. She used to lead a large choir in the Nayaragusa refugee camp in Tanzania. She grew up there herself. Her extended family had fled from violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and then spent almost 25 years in Tanzania before resettlement in San Diego in 2016. I met Matrida that fall when she arrived at St. Luke's with her two young children and her voice that moves worshipers to tears, whether or not they understand Swahili or Kimbembe. Matrida also leads a band which recently held a Congolese gospel concert at the church on a Saturday night. The diverse audience cheered as the dancers moved in unison, and my own voice rose unbridled when her nine-year-old son temporarily took center stage. It was a victory cry. Let's just say he hasn't received a lot of positive attention at school since his U.S. arrival. The next day, a white congregant in his 70s said he couldn't stop wondering about the concert. What kind of faith gets you through 25 years in a refugee camp singing God's praises? What kind of faith has you dancing and writing new songs about Jesus as you pick flowers and paint ships to try to make enough to pay the rent. What kind of faith is this? As almost everyone says these days, that's a great question. Friends, here's an even greater answer. What kind of faith is this? It is Easter faith. Faith in the crucified Jesus who shares our sufferings and faith in the re re resurrected Lord who defeated them and whose presence in our hearts gives us the hope to carry on. God gives us Easter faith, the belief that there is no darkness. Jesus has not penetrated. No pain. Jesus has not endured. No fear. He has not mastered. He journeys with us through the darkness to the light of His eternal joy. Amen. Let us pray. Glorious God of all, You are the giver of life. 
You are the one to whom we owe each breath. You are the reason for our hope. Open our hearts to faith that we may know that you are present with us as we come before you now in worship, praise, and adoration. Thank you, loving God, for the truth of Easter and its assurance that Jesus is alive and with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you for Jesus and the love that understands our fears and gently urges us to move beyond them into faith and hope and love. Thank you for Jesus and the love that overlooks our doubt and understands the way we struggle to move beyond the facts we know to the faith that assures us of your goodness, love, and power. Thank you for the grace that calls us beyond our fears, beyond our doubts, to live in the light of Easter and its resurrection joy so that amid the fears and doubts that fill our world, we may be different, strong in the assurance of your eternal love, and glad in the difference you bring to our hearts and minds. Help us so to live that day by day we may express your loving life that conquers death and masters fear and makes us anew, your beloved people. Lord, you know the pain, the fear, the crippling uncertainty that grips your world right now. We too are caught up in those feelings, worrying about the risk of infection, concerned over the risk of daily life being disrupted, cut off, from community and the support of friends and family, unsure of what the future holds for us and for our nation and our world. Dear Lord, assure us that strong though those feelings are, you are stronger still. Powerful though this virus is, you are more so. Confused and contradictory though our leaders are, in you there is truth and integrity and love. Help us rest in these virtues. Help us draw on your strength. Help us live as those who find meaning in the crucified and risen Lord. Hear us as we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are struggling to combat this virus. And we pray for all who fear for loved ones ill or dying. We pray for those who suffer on their own, cut off from loved ones. And we pray for those who are homeless and at special risk. Lord, be near to meet the needs that weigh your people down and point the way to trust and hope. We pray for those whose work sustains the daily life of our communities, garbage collectors, postal workers, transportation staffs. We pray for those who staff our stores, who make and distribute the commodities that sustain our daily lives. We pray for those who serve in food banks, caring ministries and charities, often putting themselves at risk. We pray for those who mourn lives that have been lost, especially those denied a proper way to say goodbye and affirm the blessings of the life now gone. Give comfort, we pray. Give your gentle presence and your peace to heal the hurts 
and to overcome the guilt that all too readily arises. Lord, teach us in these days how we should live, how we should care, how we should reshape our priorities, whom we should trust. And beyond our daily circumstances, anchor our lives by faith in you and trust in your eternal love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christ is alive and comes to bring good news to this and every age. Be strong in that truth as you seek to live the life of faith and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen.